Welcome. We're delighted to have you with us on A Look Ahead. This is a program in which we are looking at the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for, in this case, the third quarter of 2020, I'm sorry, 2012. Um, this is actually the last in a series of lessons we've been studying on the books of First and Second Thessalonians. And it will cover 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 3, 18. We would really encourage you to get out your Bible, open it up. If you have a Bible study guide, open that as well, and let's have a look at lesson number 13. But before we do that, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer together. Our wonderful Father, we bow now before you, requesting your presence to be especially close to us as we open your Bible once again to f try to trace and follow your thoughts after you as you presented them to your friend Paul. May we now comprehend and understand what is here for us as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You probably recognize that the those two little books of Thessalonians, First and Second Thessalonians, are famous for their comments about the second coming of Jesus Christ. But we need to recognize, looking at the total picture, that while Paul is discussing those major issues in Christianity, he also deals with a lot of relatively minor but very important practical issues as well. Things like, how do you get along at church? And what does one do with people who are unruly, even lazy? Of course, none of us would have unruly or lazy people in our churches, right? <laughs> well, what happens to a plant that doesn't grow? Sooner or later it dies. And there are a lot of wise people who have suggested down through the generations that the same thing happens with churches. They either grow or they eventually sort of shrivel and die. Do they fossilize? Well, maybe so, but then all you have is stones that are ten right. church. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so God recognizes that the church needs new blood. They need new members to ask questions, to stir up thinking, and to suggest to the previous members what progress needs to be made. How does that impact a church organization that believes it is carrying the end time message, who has the present truth, as we would put it, to the entire world? God has not only given us the scriptures, but also some end time guidance that we'll talk a little bit about. How are we using all of that information and that guidance? Are we making maximum use of the scriptures and for Seventh-day Adventists, the writings of Ellen White? Well, let's look at 2 Thessalonians 2, starting with verse 13, where we're beginning for our study for today. We must thank God at all times for you, brothers and sisters, you whom the Lord loves, and I'm reading from the Good News Translation, for God chose you as the first to be saved by the Spirit's power to make you his holy people and by your faith in the truth. God called you to this through the good news we preach to you. He called you to possess your share of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, our brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold on to these truths which we taught you both in our preaching and in our letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and in his grace gave us unfailing courage and a firm hope, encourage you and strengthen you always to do and say what is good. So that's the first passage. And immediately it presents us with some interesting little challenges. Um, it's interesting that the prayer he, he included here is very much like the prayer that he put, put at the beginning of 1 Thessalonians. And if you know a little bit of Paul's habits, it's almost like he's making bookends for his, uh, his two books here. Um, once again, Paul returned to giving thanks for, his, for the believers in Thessalonica. He called them the chosen of God. He called them the faithful because they had remained faithful not only to Scripture, but to what they had been told, taught by Paul and his friends, both in the oral form while they were there and in the written form 
in his letters. So here were people who were getting messages in various ways. But there's an interesting little issue for you who want to be a little scholarly in, in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. Now we have, I think here around the table, people with several different translations. What do you have in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13? My version says, For God chose you as the first. Now some editions, some versions have first fruits. Some have from the beginning. What, what do some of you have? As the first cons, uh, converts is in the note of the RSV. As the first converts, okay. Anybody I, have something significantly different than that? The main text of the RSV just says from the beginning. From the beginning, okay. I, I have among the first to experience salvation. Among the first to experience salvation. Anybody else? What do you have? I have the New American Standard, and it... Uh, after the little bit after the beginning, then it says, "From the beginning, for salvation okay. through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth." From the beginning. Yeah. Now here's the challenge. Some versions say first or first fruits, and the others say from the beginning. Now, why the difference? It doesn't sound very much like to us. This is a reminder of some of the challenges that people have if they try to translate from one language to another. In the Greek, as it was in Paul's day. Writing was done only in capital letters, and there was no spaces between the words. So you have to read along, and you have to figure out, as you're zooming along, where the spaces belong, and as well as what word combinations are there. So modern translators not only have to translate, but they also have to decide where to put the spaces between words. The Greek, are the Greek word involved here is aparche. The first two letters, ap, are the abbreviation, or our, our shortened version of the, the Greek preposition, apo, which means from. And arche, of course, is the, you, recommend, you recognize the archaeology, study of old things, or in some, in some cases, the Michael, the archangel, the first of the angels, you recommend it's something old, something from the beginning, okay? But, having said that, it's easy to see where they could get from the beginning. However, if you put the two parts together and make one word, aparche, it means first fruits. So here's a case where some translators want to put the two parts together, and they have a perfect right to do that and get first fruits. Other people pull it apart and say, no, it probably should be aparche from the beginning. And who's to decide? Now, the interesting thing about this is John is, does this a lot. More than, more than Paul, but Paul, it's quite likely that Paul, of course, who understood the nuance, nuances of Greek very well, it's very likely that he intended both. And you're, it's left up to you to read both of those meanings as you're reading along. Quite likely. Well, even though Paul stated that those believers were chosen either as first fruits or from the beginning, he proceeded to say in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, that faithful church members were to stand firm and hold on to those truths which were taught you both in our preaching and in our letter. Once again, there's an interesting challenge in the Greek. The word translated, which we taught you in, our, in, my, in my Good News translation, is usually translated in the more traditional translations as tradition. Now, some of you will recognize that tradition has a, a bad name in some contexts. Why is that? Not necessarily right. Not necessarily right. It means something that was handed down. Isn't that what tradition means? Well, it's something handed down, right? But okay. it doesn't have a... It often means we're doing something because we've been doing it forever and we really don't know why we're doing it. Nope. It didn't necessarily well, come from God. Usually what tradition means in the Christian context it was originally a very important word in the Catholic Church. And it means we do this because this is what those in front of us did and those before them did it and those before them did it. It's been handed down and this is the way it is because the church fathers somewhere back there declared that that's the way it was. You don't have to have proof about it from, from scripture. This is the way it is from the church fathers. Nobody asks. And you're not allowed to ask. Well, it turns out very interestingly that the word here is actually the adjective form of the Greek word paradidomi. Where have we run across paradidomi before? 
given up. Romans. In Romans 1, it talks about the wicked people are handed over by God to the consequences of their own evil behavior. And Romans 4.25, Jesus was handed over. Now, the translators used to say handed over to death, but it doesn't say that in Greek. It just says he was given up. He was handed over the at the day, time when he died on the cross. The other day, we, I, we, I asked you something about that, and where it's in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. And you said that was just didemy. Mm -hmm. Now, is, what does para, para mean? It, in that didomi context. means to give. Okay. Para did mean to hand over, to give over, okay. to pass on, something like that. Okay. So it, it adds a little extra flavor to it. Okay. Well, Paul is here talking about the truths which he and the other apostles have handed over to the church members. This is what we handed over to you. So, another interesting little con, a little word there. Well, some scholars consider this to be the first hint that the New Testament canon was being developed. Now, what do you think? Do you think Paul, when he wrote these two short books, thought he was starting the New Testament? No, I don't think so. Don't think so? He was writing a letter to friends. He was writing a letter to friends that he loved. Well, didn't he, he have some idea that it was going to be passed around? <laughs> he well, definitely, probably, well, yeah. So he definitely said that later. But as to what it was going to become part of what we... Revered. Now, the, the question would be, would he consider the words that he wrote down and sent to them as of equal importance with the Old Testament scriptures? That's the question. Well, well, about, well it depends what he's talking about. <laughs> Peter said some things about, yes. about Paul's writings, which seemed to, to indicate that they were on par with About nature. 15 years later, Peter wrote saying some things that Paul wrote which, um, along with the other scripture, something like that, whatever. And so apparently it was pretty quickly recognized that these writings of Paul were to be gathered together and regarded as, as important. Well, he, Paul had had instruction in, through the visions directly from God, so why wouldn't he think it was yeah. important? I mean, it, He was talking about his gospel. Mm -hmm. and, so, and somebody wanted that. to say something else, well, he'd condemn them to hell. Yes. Well, he, one. So did he think he was that this might know. be? Yeah, I think in that respect he based, did. Based upon his background as a certainly as an Old Testament scholar and intimate with, you know, how those things were developed, why well, you know might very well have had an inclination that you know this is very similar to to how things have developed in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So who knows? My guess is that he would have hoped that the people that listened to it would appreciate it and embody its principles whether mm. well think about this he has just started a church he had a brief time to be with them three weeks maybe yeah. a little bit more yeah. and he's hoping that anything he can do will you know settle them into the truth cement them into the truth prevent them from wandering away or giving up because there these people are being persecuted I mean this is a difficult time for them and so Paul is doing everything he can to but as, strengthen them. As, as time went on, among the many writings of Paul and, and others of the day, mm -hmm. there was a set of writings that, that the churches tended mm -hmm. to, to rely on, to appreciate, and say, this is, this is good stuff. Yeah. And basically the canon was somebody who said, we're going to make a canon out of these writings. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, People somehow have the idea that, you know, the Bible descended with amid uh, showers uh, from straight from heaven, and probably in the King James English. Uh, but it didn't happen like that. What actually happened is there were a lot of writings going around, and uh, the majority of them were not reputable and not reliable. So what happened over time is that churches tended to copy and keep the parts that they saw were good and useful. And over time, finally, people are saying, say, well, you know, it looks like this book and this book and this book and this and da-da-da-da. These are the ones that are useful. We ought to keep those. And I think that is, is just great because look how many people the Holy Spirit had to work on and to, to work with to make this collection. Mm -hmm. So it could never be confused with one person's mm -hmm. uh, endeavor, decision. decision. Yeah, I can understand how 
Paul might have thought, well, I'm writing Romans. You know, this is a you know, very well thought out description of God's plan. But Thessalonians, this is advice to junior members. Mm -hmm. Do you really think that he thought he was writing the Bible, uh, something well, equivalent to Isaiah at that time? How many times do you think he planned to start new churches? That would need exactly this kind of advice. Lots. Lots. As long as he drew yeah. breath. No, he, he, didn't, he didn't mean that First Thessalonians is going to be equal to Romans in terms of all that it taught and all the implications. No, that wasn't the point. He said, something's being written here that will, will serve well churches under various circumstances and it ought to be preserved. I yeah. think so. Yeah. Well, now the next question comes. Paul was talking about something that Christians have struggled with down through the centuries. Which is more reliable and more important, the oral tradition or the written tradition? Now, what's the difference? Well, what are the advantages of each? If you're present and you hear someone speak the message, you not only hear the words, but also you hear the tone of the voice and you see the expression on the face. And you know that people can say things where they're saying exactly the same words, but by the tone of their voice and the look on their face, they mean exactly opposite meanings. You know, we, we all have had that experience. So we know that the tone and the expression and the facial expressions are worth. In fact, some people have said that 90% of the meaning, the real meaning of something, is not in the words itself, but in all the other nuances that go with it. So this would suggest that the oral tradition would be more reliable because one could get the full picture instead of just a partial picture. However, on the other hand, the oral tradition, unless recorded and preserved in places like YouTube, and I think everything in the world is being preserved on YouTube today, <laughs> But unless you have it preserved some way like that, then it just becomes a memory in the minds of, of its hearers. And after a while, that memory may slip a little. And of course, if you're talking over generations, people die and they pass on stories, well, I think I heard da 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 da. And how reliable is that, you know, 500 years later? So the farther you get from the original letter or the original uh, sermon, the more you have to rely on what's written. Yeah. Thus the written tradition, yeah. And then when you put something in writing, or transcribe something that was in writing, excuse me, in orally into writing, you don't always necessarily get the right meaning that the original speaker had. Yeah. Because right. communication in writing is different than yeah. orally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what we're talking I about. I guess that's where you have to depend on the Holy Spirit, isn't mm -hmm. it? So, over a long time, as Norm has already suggested, the written tradition tends to stand out because while it may not be as comprehensive, you know, you don't have all the nuances, you don't have the facial expressions, you don't have the, you know, those, all that to it, it is relatively permanent compared to the oral tradition. Today we have thousands of handwritten ancient copies of portions, portions are all of Paul's writings. Even though we live almost 2,000 years later, there is little or no doubt about what Paul actually wrote, in Greek, anyway. Mm -hmm. The question left for us is, how do we interpret it? Of course, that's, that's a, first of all, how do we translate it? And then once we've translated it, how do we understand what we have translated? So that's always going to be a challenge. Communication involves using symbols mm -hmm. and to come to share meanings. Well, what a symbol m met 2,000 years ago may not, be, may not mean the same thing today. Not so. even 2,000 years ago, 50 years ago. Yeah. I mean, uh, an example is, you know, 50 years ago we used, to, we used to have happy Christian songs that talk about being gay. Well, you know, I don't think we would do that today. <laughs> <laughs> it has come to have a different meaning. And we won't even sing it in that. French. <laughs> Archbishop Trench okay. of the, uh, back in the, what, the 19th century, uh, who started the, uh, what became the Oxford English Dictionary says sim words are symbols of ideas. Mm -hmm. and it has been yeah. said that word reading is to bring meaning to those words. Okay, now I want to I want to throw you a real question: Which is more important to your paradigm of beliefs, the written tradition, and the examples, of course, would be scriptures and perhaps the writings of Ellen White, or is it too the oral tradition as presented by preachers and others in various meetings and services? 
Well, you can't get to the source anymore if you want to pick the oral. Well, but they, people have people have things to say that aren't directly in scripture, so it's, I, it's new with them. I, I think you take what they say, check it out with scripture. I mean, like the Bereans did. Yeah, if there's, if it doesn't concord with the, the law, original. with the law and the testimony, it's because there's no light in them. So forget them. <laughs> How does that work, though? Because it is something different, because you wouldn't go to the Bible if it wasn't something different. And then how do you use the thing that is not different to prove that the thing that's new... Well, who on earth said you wouldn't go to the Bible? No, I mean... You go to that before I'm, you go there. My question is, how does that happen? I'm not questioning going to the Bible. Oh. How does it happen? I mean, when you, no. Ellen White talks about present truth a lot. You what, know, what? And, and so so something is still changing, even though the Bible is fixed with its text. As time goes on, things do change. Well, here's 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 the question. Let's let's make it very practical now. We happen to live in a place where there's quite a number of Adventist churches within a short distance. Yeah. You can go to a different church every week, I think, for probably a whole year, and without driving too far, um, in Adventist churches. Um, having said that, every once in a while, especially the major churches, will get a new pastor. And that pastor may have some new messages, different approach to certain things, and quite often the result will be what? <laughs> a whole bunch of people who are used to attending other churches join that church because they, man, have you heard the new pastor at so-and-so, you know, you need to go over there and hear what he has to say. Now, the question I have is, <clears throat> does it happen because he's a better interpreter of Scripture or, be, or because he's more charismatic? Yes. We <laughs> <laughs> both. Yeah. What does charismatic have to do with the truth? Well, he asked why the people went over there. Didn't say whether it was truth or no. not. Okay. I said, so is it I, guess, I guess people flock after entertainment, too. So Right. Exactly. Right. Charismatic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly the point. No, no, that doesn't happen in our fellowship, in our faith. Dream on. We, we always <laughs> go to wherever the truth is. I see. Okay. Well, Paul had a special comment about the Bereans, which I hope you, I'm sure you all remember. Acts 17:11. The people there were more open-minded than the people in Thessalonica. It's talking about the Bereans. They listened to the message with great eagerness, and every day they studied the scriptures to see if what Paul said was really true. Now, I'm going to ask you, you know, this is a time we talk about the practical questions, the practical issues, okay? How many of those people who flock to a new church because they like the new pastor go home and say, hmm, is, is, is what he's preaching exactly what the scripture says? Or do they go home and say, man, I like that new preacher? You know, there was, there was a preacher on television that some relative just loved. Mm -hmm. And so they brought the tape to church and we, we watched it. And afterwards, they said, oh, that was so good, that was so good. And then I asked him, you know, what, what did he say? <laughs> well, it was a good, it was a good sermon. <laughs> uh, it was just, it was hilarious, actually. Um, yeah. Dr. Maxwell used to talk about a time when he was at Pacific Union College years and years ago. <laughs> and a, a gentleman came from, I think, one of the big universities in the West. And he was really into philosophy and that kind of stuff. And he gave this sermon using all these big, long philosophical words. And he went on and on like this. And boy, the students came to Dr. Maxwell's class the next day and said, wow, that was really something. And Dr. Maxwell says, well, what did he say? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> they didn't know what he said, but they loved all those big, fancy words. <laughs> So, well, what about us? Of course, that's where the rubber meets the road, right? Considering our own situation and our own progress in the gospel, 
Do we find ourselves slipping away from the traditions that we once believed? Or do we find ourselves settling more and more firmly, both intellectually and spiritually, into the truth? And guess where I'm talking about now? So uh, explain to me what the difference of that is again. How do what you, the how difference do you, between that question? Yeah. How do you know whether whether you're abandoning traditions or just embracing new light? And that's, the, that's exactly the question. Or well, getting careless. Or oh, getting careless. Okay. Well, let's look at some options, okay? Embracing tradition or mm -hmm. accepting new light? Let, let's, Ellen White says, at the end of time, there will be a great period of sealing. And she says, sealing is a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. We will be like Paul was in Galatians 1 when it comes to the gospel. He said, if someone comes and tries to give you a different gospel than the one I gave you, may he be condemned to hell. And he meant it just like that. This is not a swear word. He's talking about fire, okay? But these people are preaching that I've misinterpreted that gospel. Yes. And the people are believing because they're respecting the mask of authority. They've got lots of scripture and, and, well, <clears throat> and lots of PhDs behind their names, and they've got charisma. I, I, <laughs> I will tell you about someone that I know personally, not really well, but I met him once or twice, who was known absolutely as a charismatic guy, and he had followers. He had, he had pastors following his teachings that left their churches just so they could follow his teachings. He was, I mean, he was very influential. And I know some cases where this guy just would expound along and he would say, so-and-so has said this and so-and-so has said that. And if you looked up the quotations, you found out that the, the actual quotation said he had just pulled out just the piece he wanted. It said the exact opposite of we, what he, the way he was using it. What do we do when that kind of thing happens? That's satanic. Yeah. He's deceptive. And it makes it palatable, makes it easy for people to buy the line, but it's satanic. But how do I keep from buying that line? How do I, how do I keep from becoming like well, those people or getting suckered into that? That's exactly the question, and, and, and that's the question I want to ask you. Um, but don't can't ask me. I already asked you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, how do we avoid deception? How do we avoid the counterfeit? Everything with the true, which is yeah, scripture. we've we've got to become so familiar with the true that when we when the counterfeit shows up, we know that's not the truth. Well, but isn't that what these other folk did? Didn't they think they were they were yeah. so well founded that they were understanding the truth? How do you if you want to study the moon. You can look at it, and you can describe, and you can draw pictures of what you see. But then, if you really want to study, you get out a telescope, and you see things that you didn't see before. They were always there, but you didn't see them because you weren't looking through the telescope. Fortunately, I think we have been given a wonderful telescope uh, to look at these things with and check out. Uh, what we can look at and what we can trust. And I look through a telescope and I see. Uh, yeah, you can a have a foggy lens. You can have a, a scratch a lens. Feature of God's creation, but somebody else looks at it and they see a product of, uh, of evolutionary evolution. Yeah. Well, don't we have to look at the whole picture, mm -hmm. the whole breadth of the picture that we can get out of the scriptures? Because we've run a foul of times, and I don't think we're the only ones that have done it, of proof texting things. You've got to look at the whole overview. You know, the whole picture is pretty big, though. Well, I mean, where, how big do you have to get it. before you're settled the into the you truth? The bigger you get, the better you are. You better, you better you are. The clearer the I don't know. Sometimes I think the settling of the truth is narrower than you think. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's something that's more into the foundation of everything, more than just some big thing. Yeah. So uh, finding oh. that narrow piece may be what the, the, 
the action and actually, you know, getting settled is, not how much you know. Okay, let, let, me, let me take you some, to some interesting examples. When I was a child growing up in a small church far away from here, you would have been disfellowshipped for wearing a wedding ring. Yeah. Is now that we've sort of given up that, that taboo, if you will, are, is our standards slipping? Depends on which church you're going to. Well, some of that yeah. depends on what <laughs> culture you come from. Yes, I, I realize that. I remember getting back to what you said as a child. Uh, we used to hit people over the head with proof texts. Mm -hmm. That's not right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it might be, but in the overview, no. How do I you think we've learned a little bit about that. How do you distinguish using here a little and there a little to develop truth? from proof text. Well, I'm not saying it. it I'm mm -hmm. just saying you've got to be careful. I read something recently that wasn't from, I'll just put it this way, our, brac our background, and this was brought up. And the more I thought about it, the more I looked back and I thought there's a lot of truth in what was being said here. All I'm saying is you've got to be a little careful what you pull out. You, You've got to look at the picture overall to see if you're heading in the right direction. Yes, but what are the ground rules for telling, uh, for identifying when somebody is proof texting you or when somebody is showing you the, the, the things that develop a new concept? It, it, yeah. it needs to be taken in the larger context. Yeah. It needs to, you need to read on, you need to look at the whole picture. Yeah. I, th I think often when we refer to proof texts, we're often we're often really uh, alluding to how they were used. Mm -hmm. yeah. They were used as hammers or bullets or, or yeah, bullets. something. <laughs> how about if you have a proclivity to drink in alcohol and you read the proof text, it says, take the tithe and buy strong drink of it and rejoice before the Lord. Deuteronomy 14, it says it right there. I mean, it's, and you go back to what, Proverbs 31, well, give wine to the poor so that they can forget their misery. That's a proof text. Oh, it <laughs> sounds pretty straightforward to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't have that proclivity. I've never tried the, the alcohol, so I don't know. But, but there's but another side to that. In, in a lot of those earlier times, and certainly in the Middle Ages and even later, the only safe thing to drink was, was alcoholic wine. Probably You've got typhoid if you drank anything else. Yeah. You know, there's two ways of looking at that. Well, many of us can remember the time when it seemed like the biggest issue was something or other about women's dresses. I mean, is that a standard which has changed or been dropped or whatever? And it seems like in even more modern times, the issues become worship styles. Are you allowed to have drums in church? Oh dear. Guitars. Guitars. Hmm. It turns out that drums and plucking instruments are both mentioned in the Psalms. Yeah. Does that make those all right, but other instruments that are more modern? Are not allowed. What do we do with all that? You know, I hate wearing rings. Okay. I hate it. I would almost become an Adventist just to get out of wearing rings. <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, you know, when I went to public school or the public university, I didn't wear a ring, and a couple of girls came up and chewed me out for not wearing a ring telling me that, telling everybody that I was married, what are you trying to do to your wife? Uh -huh. And so, well, my grandma would say, oh, this is a great time to witness. But man, they were so upset about it, there would be no way I could have witnessed anything there. Uh -huh. <laughs> but um, see, there's, you know, it just depends what your motivation is too, and whether you keep that stuff. Growing up in New York City, I have older sisters. My mother would not allow them to wear pants. It would be freezing. Mm -hmm. And she know you have to wear a dress, they would be made fun of. And also, uh, no one had, uh, I did not have holes in my ear. Uh, the day I turned 18, I put three holes in my ear. I did, because it was fun too, and because I, I didn't see the connection between jewelry and salvation. Mm -hmm. It made no sense to me. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let's get on to more challenging subject. <laughs> Look, uh, before we leave that, Ken, um, we're, we're asking how do you tell the difference. Um, I, th I, think there, I think there's something to be said for an earnest heart mm -hmm. as one pursues the scripture and, and to know that 
you're not just alone. Just as the, as I've mentioned this before, just as the Holy Spirit was here guiding these people as they wrote, the Holy Spirit is here as you read and mm -hmm. as you study. So just to to enter this kind of a thing with total trepidation and 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 fear that you're going to do something wrong and be paralyzed by that, I, I think we need to take confidence yeah. that well, here's, here's, here's the, the bottom line question. Does any of the, do any of those things we've discussed in the last five minutes or so have anything at all to do with salvation? And Paul makes a very important point in 1 Corinthians, uh, it would be chapter 10, I believe it is, near the end, where it's basically he says, if you're doing something that upsets another believer, you shouldn't do it. Because you might impact that person's salvation. So that's one of the considerations we need to, we need to think about. I, I think the results of your study often depend on the attitude that you have when you go into the study. Mm -hmm. If you are looking for s to, to get rid of something that you don't like because it conflicts with your, your desires, well, then you'll come up with one answer. If with broken heart you're coming to find out what, what God who loves you so much will, would, would, would want you to do for your best interest, you may come to a completely different. Yeah. You know, I think a classic example, what you're alluding to there is, um, I read uh, uh, a story about Ellen, Ellen White and someone gave her, a, it was a small gold watch that could pin on, or maybe it was a brooch or something like that. I think it was a watch. And she wore that, but there was, she received objections. There were people that were concerned about that. So she writes that she chose not to wear it anymore. Mm -hmm. So is that what you're talking yeah. about, those kinds of things when Paul is, <clears throat> but you're not talking about standing up for <clears throat> the truth? Or, no, uh, no, no. Okay. Moving now to chapter 3, reading the first five verses. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, the first five verses. Finally, our brothers and sisters, pray for us that the Lord's message may continue to spread rapidly and be received with honor, just as it was among you. And Paul certainly believed that it had been received with honor among the Thessalonians. Pray also that God will rescue us from wicked and evil people, for not everyone believes the message. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and keep you safe from, and the Greek says literally, the evil. Is it talking about the evil one, as my translation has? Or is it talking about evil as a principle? And the Lord gives us confidence in you, and we are sure that you are doing and will continue to do what we tell you. May the Lord lead you into a greater understanding of God's love and the endurance that is given by Christ. So, is Satan real? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah? You put yourself in a relative minority when you talk about a real Satan in our day. Many people laugh at the idea of a real Satan. Many do not believe him. They don't even believe he exists. Some think that the idea of Satan is merely a, a metaphor for evil in general. Some people consider him to be nothing more than mere superstition. By contrast, the Bible speaks very, very clearly about a literal Satan. He started the rebellion in heaven, Revelation 12, uh, 7 to 12. He, was, he has been opposing God's people in every possible way, if you read on in that chapter. He is the one who accuses us both day and night. Zechariah 3, 1 to 5 talks about that. He was responsible for killing Job's children and destroying his wealth and bringing disease to Job himself. Job 1, 2, and read the conclusion, Job 42. In Scripture, we see him opposing every major action that God has tried to undertake to help his people. He tried to kill Jesus when he was a few, just a matter of a few months old. Paul himself recognized his need for constant prayer. He asked the Thessalonians, these brand new converts, to pray for him that the gospel would continue to spread rapidly and that wicked people who do not believe may not succeed in stopping it and to continue to be faithful to the Lord and avoiding the devil. In verses 2 and 3 that we just read, 
Notice how Paul once again was using wordplay. Not all people believe, who believe have faith, but the Lord is faithful. Paul loved those kinds of wordplays. Most of us would agree that God is more powerful than the devil. God is actually keeping the devil alive and could terminate his existence at any moment. Just has to pull the plug on him. But we also recognize that the devil is more powerful than we are. At least most of us would recognize that. So how does the great controversy actually take place in our minds? When we are being tempted, is it clear that God is more powerful than Satan? Or do we feel more like we are the weakest one around? I, Paul can... Yeah. I have a question. Uh -huh. Regarding, uh, he was responsible for killing Job's children and destroying. I've always had a problem with Job because I don't believe, I believe we've missed something in the story. I don't believe the God I know and adore would be in consort with the devil to uh, allow what happened to Job to happen to him. Also, I don't understand what the devil is doing going up and down in heaven around God. Mm -hmm. I've had problem with that. Well, let's talk about that for a moment. In the context of Job, it looks like God from time to time calls a council of beings who were heads of various worlds and so forth around the universe. And they come to heaven as a council. Under those circumstances, Satan himself shows up and says, I deserve to be in this council because I'm head of this earth. So that's the basis. He wasn't welcomed by God, but he was allowed by God because he claimed that this earth was his domain. Then you can see what happened as a result of the argument. God had said, Job is a faithful and upright man. Satan says, that's impossible. No human being could be that. I mean, I, I control everyone on this planet. They're all my servants. They do what I tell them to do. There's not one of them is faithful to you. And God says, well, let's see. And he says, unfortunately, in order to do that, we're going to have to allow some pretty awful things to take place. Satan, he's yours, but you can't kill him. Then later, well, Satan... First of all, you couldn't touch him. I think that was the first round, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm sorry. You can't, you can't touch his, him himself personally. Then later, Satan... You can, you can do whatever you like to him, but you can't kill him. And no matter what Satan did, sent those terrible counselors, etc., Job, he said some pretty, pretty scary things, but he remained faithful to God. Nothing happened to Job that, that was any worse than what happened to Jesus. Right. And Jesus did never sin. Mm -hmm. And the short lifespan that, that Job had is insignificant compared to the eternity. I, I'd like to imagine that, uh, I don't think it happened, but let's say that God and Job had a conversation. And God was saying, I think they had a lot of conversations. Was saying, you know, I need somebody to demonstrate that I can tell the future. Mm -hmm. Now, it's going to be pretty expensive for you. It's going to cost you tremendously. But would you be willing to do that with me? <coughs> And I think the friend Job would say, God, if that's what you want, count me in. Mm -hmm. That doesn't quite work for the big protest that everybody has against God. And that is, if there's a real true loving God, why is there so much terror, mayhem, evil in the world? Why do babies die? Why do we have so many diseases and all that stuff? So that's a he didn't answer. come. No, he didn't. It's 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 about the no. same. No, it's it's part of the same answer. I would agree. It's a different part of the same answer, but the answer is this: Satan claimed in the beginning that he could run a better universe than God, and God says, "No, that's not true." Satan says, "Yes, it is true." Okay, now you know, and we we're going to talk about this in a in a future lesson, but. Uh, you know, we, we bias everybody's thinking, at least if they're serious Christians, almost immediately because we say this is God's side and that's Satan's side. Which side do you want to be on? I mean, immediately we've already biased people. But if you weren't really sure whose side, I mean, here's God and here's his, mo his foremost spokesman and they seem to be saying opposite things and you're going, mm -hmm. who's telling me the truth here? And this arc, this discussion between God and Satan is going on probably before the rest of the beings. They're, they're, at least oh, they're sure. getting reports. Yeah. And so 
God, Jesus, has to come across in the way he really is. And that is not verbally uh, beaten up on, on Lucifer. Well, Satan. But, but, and more than that, yeah, Satan has to be given at least a, a semblance of a chance to show what would happen if he were in charge. Exactly. And that's what you're talking about. See? Now, we may not be able to see that right now. We will see that in the future. But the rest of the universe looking on, they see who's responsible for that right now. And they see who's causing all that stuff. And they have turned against Satan 100%. There's no the question cross. in their yep. mind. Right. And it's only going to get worse because God is gradually withdrawing his spirit from this earth and letting Satan have more and more control because he's saying, okay, there's going to be one final demonstration of what it would be like to have. And that final demonstration will terminate in the seven last plagues. And then God will say, okay, whose side would you like, who would you like to have in charge of the universe from now on? Well, I like to look at Job, mm -hmm. answer these people by looking at Job. Mm -hmm. And if you say it's different, well then I've lost my argument. No, no your argument <laughs> with Job is, is this one that we just said. God said Job can be trusted, he's my man. And Satan says, no way. Chapter 4, he says, there's not, not a creature of clay that you could ever trust. And God says, oh yeah, just watch. And Job, I mean, Satan did everything he possibly could to Job. You come over to chapter 42, and what does God say? Job has said of me what is right. And he says, you didn't hear it right the first time, I'll say it again. Job has said of me what is right. So God and Job won that argument. Hands down, Satan was defeated. But he was also condemning the smooth arguments yeah. that the other four philosophers had, yeah, the four, is, four theologians he, he, had. He was part of Satan's argument. Yeah. They were part of Satan's argument. Yeah. Do we have any evidence that the death of Job's children had any kind of uh, implications as to their salvation? No. God will, God will treat them absolutely fairly. They will be judged honestly. I mean, it's the same way with the people who died in the flood. The same, people, same way with the firstborn who were killed in Egypt. So those people will all be judged based on their lives and, the, and what, what would have happened to them in the future that God already knows. And he will, they will judge them based on the lives that they lived or the future that they didn't live. God will judge them fairly on that basis, not on the basis of whether they happen to be part of something that God needed to say at a given point in history. If we remove the devil from the conversation with God prior to what happened to Job, then is Job's situation, does it parallel Abraham and Isaac? Job's situation? Well, let me say it in a different way. Uh, Abraham taking his son mm -hmm. to kill him because his God said to kill him, mm -hmm. does that fit some kind of way uh, with what happened to Job? Because and he too was quite faithful. They were, but they were both severe tests. Yeah, they were severe tests. And it was uh, what Job did with Abraham and Isaac, similar to what God the Father did with his son. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, he shared, it, he shared it on a finite level right. with, with one of his creatures what God, the infinite, was, or the Father was going to do with his son. Okay, well, we need to get back to Thessalonians. Let's take a careful look at how Scripture and tradition are related. And that's reading the next three verses, starting with verse 6 of chapter 3. Our brothers and sisters, we command you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to keep away from all believers who are living a lazy life and who do not follow the instructions that we gave them. That's pretty clear, isn't it? You yourselves know very well that you should do just what we did. We were not lazy when we were with you. We did not accept anyone's support without paying for it. Instead, we worked and toiled. We kept working day and night so as not to be an expense to any of you. So what's Paul telling us? Make sure you contribute. <laughs> yeah. This basic. <laughs> well, think about this. While Jesus was here on this earth, the only scripture that was available was the Old Testament. Unfortunately, the Pharisees primarily had added a huge volume of requirements that they touted to be virtually equal with the scriptures themselves. For Christians in the early days, it was the spoken words of Jesus that were their guidelines. You know, we have lots of references for that. When they met together as groups, they discussed Jesus' words and actions. That was all the authority they thought they needed. 
1 Thessalonians 4, 15, and Acts 20, 35, and 1 Corinthians 11, 22 to 26. However, over time, the disciples became widely scattered, and almost all of them suffered martyrs' deaths. Before that happened, the Holy Spirit, speaking to the apostles, guided them to speak the truth, and in some cases to write it down, thus correctly interpreting the words of Jesus. And we have examples, John 15, 26 and 27, and John 16, 13 to 15. With, within one generation, the New Testament had been written and was generally accepted as Scripture. And these are where we look at those verses that you mentioned earlier from, from 2 Peter. Look at verse 2. I want you to remember the words that were spoken long ago by the Holy Prophets and the command from the Lord and Savior which was given to you by your apostles. So he's what? He's making those more or less equivalent, isn't he? And then if you drop down to verse 16, this is... and. and uh, as our dear brother Paul wrote to you in verse 15, you're using the wisdom that God gave him. This is what he says in all his letters when he writes on the subject. There are some difficult things in his letters which ignorant and unstable people explain falsely, as they do with other passages of the scriptures, so they bring on their own destruction. So by the time he died, Peter was equating whose writings with scripture? Paul's. Paul's. Yeah. Okay, the writings of the apostles and their teachings were rapidly accepted as being equal to the canon of the Old Testament. Should we, or have we, treated the writings of Ellen White in the same way? I see some people shaking their heads. So now Paul, turned, while you're thinking about that, now Paul turns to some very practical <coughs> considerations. He pointed out that while he himself and his associates were in Thessalonica, they did not expect to be supported by those who heard them preach. They worked hard to support themselves. Is working hard to support yourself as much a teaching the gospel as the other fundamental truths that we believe? Yeah. My translation here says they want uh, models for an example. Mm -hmm. Paul went so far as to say that they should stay away from those who rejected these new messages. Should we do the same in the 21st century with those who are not sure they believe in Ellen White or those who want to sponge on the church? Well, Paul went beyond presenting the written word and the oral tradition. He also demonstrated the truth through his behavior. He worked hard to support himself so no one could equate him with one of those street preachers we talked about a few lessons ago with whom the Thessalonians were very familiar. Paul called those who did not cooperate and did not accept that kind of teaching disorderly, even lazy people. So what about it? Should we hold current church leaders to this same standard? What about fellow church members? Is the advice of verse 10 still valid? Yes. Mm -hmm. We're going to go there right now. You want to read that? Yeah. Well, in this version it says, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you, mm -hmm. that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We well, just put them on welfare. Well, we'll just throw them. some church organizations allow or even encourage their pastors to work at a separate job to help support themselves. Why do Adventists refuse to, to, to accept that kind of stuff? We want our pastors to work full time for what they do for the church, don't we? By the way, just in passing as we're nearing the end of our time here, if you're interested in looking at what we're looking at in our, in our studies here, <coughs> these lessons are all available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, theox dot O-R-G. Welcome to join us in looking at it. Well, look at verses 9 to 11. Now, Norm's already read us verse 12. We did this not because we have no right to demand our support. We did it to be an example for you to follow. While we were with you, we used to say to you, whoever refuses to work is not allowed to eat. We say this because we hear that there are some among you who live lazy lives and who do not nothing except meddle in other people's business. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command these people and warn them to lead orderly lives and work to earn their own living. That's pretty, pretty blunt, isn't it? So we're not to have any sympathy for freeloaders, it sounds like. Well, Paul, yes, Paul is, is not, and Paul here is not talking about 
people who are truly disabled or destitute, that kind of stuff. He's talking about people who choose to be lazy. And Paul had done everything possible not to be in that category. He worked at making tents, no? Yeah. He was targeting the willfully idle, those people who would rather be busy bodies than busy. They wanted to meddle in everyone else's business except their own. In a sense, Paul was saying true church members, and especially church leaders, will be examples in their behavior, their speech, and even their writings. Jesus himself talked about how we should deal with fellow church members who seem to be at fault in one way or another. That's a famous passage in Matthew 18, 15 to 18. Um, it's interesting at the end, he says, if they don't accept what you say, treat them as pagans, Gentiles, or tax collectors. Now here's another interpretive problem if you're going to work with the New Testament. Did he mean treat them the way other people treat pagans, Gentiles, and tax collectors, or treat them the way I, Jesus, treated pagans, Gentiles, and tax collectors? And every person has to decide which it is. Of course, Jesus treated them with kindness, consideration, and tact, didn't he? But church discipline is always a very touchy and difficult subject. There are many reasons for that. Sometimes a person who has stepped out of line is a close relative of some important or prominent church member. Some church members believe that to discipline another church member is just not Christ-like. By contrast, there are others who take a firm, very firm and even harsh line against misbehavior. So Jesus recommended this very good plan, this lot lined in Matthew 18. We won't take time to read that right now. And we'll come to our last section of verses, 2 Thessalonians 3, 15, 13 and following. But you, brothers and sisters, must not get tired of doing good. It may be that someone there will not obey the message we sent you in his letter. So take note of that person, have nothing to do with him or her, so that they will be ashamed. But do not treat them as an enemy. Instead, warn them as a fellow believer. And then his final words, may the Lord himself, who is our source of peace, give you, all, give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all. With my own hand I write this, Greetings from Paul. This is the way I sign every letter. This is how I lie, write. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And even this early in his ministry, Paul has to say, I sign this with my own hand. We don't know exactly whether he had a strange handwriting or whether his writing was big because his eyes weren't good. But he said, I want you to know this thing has my stamp of approval. I said this, and you can believe it. We hope you've enjoyed our study of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. See you next week.